Hello, and welcome to the third video in the Princeton Festival's lecture series on Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's Le Nozze di Figaro. In this video, we're going to look at the Act II finale to the opera. This massive piece of music intersects directly with a series of buffa conventions of the 18th century. However, it's de Ponte's and Mozart's skills in navigating those conventions while still serving the needs of the drama and the characters that make this particular finale so memorable to us today. So in this lecture, we'll get into exactly how they did that. As we get into the act two finale, it's important first to understand where this particular complex of scenes falls in the context of the broader drama. The end of act one sees Figaro uh, sort of telling Carabino off in a, in a humorous aria, and that concludes that act. That is with, with a single character solo aria. This uh, particular act finale, act two finale, falls at the very middle of the drama. In the context of the crazy day then, the day is at its zenith. It is noon or just past noon, and as we would expect, things are really heating up. From there, the Act Three finale follows a somewhat different format from the typical boop of finale that we will uh, discuss in this particular lecture. And then Act Four uh, concludes with a finale that is a complex similar in its broadest strokes to that of Act Two, just in terms of the genre conventions on which it draws. But as I pointed out, this particular act falls at the moment in the drama in which things are kind of reaching their peak. Uh, the particular characters' motives are all laid out in front of us, and we are asked to attempt to uh, figure out what they're going to do about it in this particular moment. Now, the first thing we kind of notice when confronting this particular passage of music is that it is massive, 940 bars of drama, and it takes up multiple scenes, uh, which we'll get into. Now, 940 bars. What do you do with 940 bars in order to keep the drama from lapsing into that unfortunate fate of, of operas of the period that didn't do so well? That is something that would bore the audience, something that is tedious to listen to. Uh, it's a challenge that was not just simply one faced by Mozart and De Ponte. In fact, as De Ponte lets us know, it was a challenge that was uh, born of the expectations of opera buffa audiences. The finale was not just something for the marriage of Figaro, it was something in fact that all opera buffas of the time had to figure their way around. As De Ponte writes, a finale which has to be closely connected with the rest of the opera, in other words, it can't be a standalone drama, is a sort of little comedy in itself and requires a fresh plot and a special interest of its own. This is the great occasion for showing off the genius of the composer, the ability of the singers, and the most effective situation of the drama. Recitative is excluded from it. Everything is sung, and every style of singing must find a place in it. Adagio, allegro, etc. And with this, the said finale generally ends. This is the musician slang. This in the musician slang is called the chiusa or stretta. I suppose because it gives not one twinge, but a hundred to the unhappy brain of the poet who has to write the words, namely De Ponte. In this finale, it is a dogma of theatrical theology that all of the singers should appear on the stage, even if there were 300 of them, by ones, by twos, by threes, by sixes, by tens, by sixties, to sing solos, duets, trios, sextets, sessantets. And if the plot of the play does not allow of it, the poet must find some way of making the plot allow of it, in defiance of his judgment, of his reason, or of all the Aristotles on earth. And if he then finds his play going badly, so much the worse for him. This is a very humorous passage, and uh, De Ponte is penning it somewhat tongue-in-cheek. But he does have a point. He lays out before us the basic fabric of the Buffa finale as we are to expect it in the, in the 18th century. That is, it is an almost entirely sung piece of music. It is put together of various musical numbers. Now, why is this important? It's important because it also has to consist of plot. That's different than our typical expectations of opera. The Opera 101 explanation of music and spoken uh, elements of opera are that the action and the plot unballs in the recitative. And then in the aria, the characters step aside in order to reflect on what has occurred. Time stands still in the, 
in the case of the music and the aria, and it moves forward quickly in the more pitter-patter recitative. What De Ponte is telling us is that the finale is not allowed to do it. There is no recitative. It's composed of sung music the entire way through, but it also has to advance the plot. And so a composer confronted with this, uh, without recourse to recitative, has to find various ways of moving the action forward without stretching the imaginations of the audience too far, or again, sort of lapsing into music that is uh, too much the same or so as to induce boredom in the audience. As the Ponte also mentions, the great challenge in this is you have to find a way to fit this little internal drama into the plot writ large. It, it has to move the larger action forward or else it is this standalone sort of concert piece but doesn't connect to, to the, broader, uh, the broader goals of the drama. And if you can't do it, well, you have to do a finale anyway, so woe to him who can't figure out this conundrum. Luckily for us, De Ponte and Mozart do in fact figure their way out of a conundrum out of the conundrum. And they do so by focusing on these sort of open-ended questions that are, uh, that the finale is meant to ostensibly solve. So over the course of the finale, various characters seem as though they're winning at different points, and then they are in fact revealed to be losing, and they sort of um, go back and forth in this vein, gradually accumulating characters as they go along until the grand finale when almost all of the characters are on stage. The only one missing in this particular finale is the gardener Antonio. And the reason Antonio is missing is that in the premiere, the same singer who sang Antonio also sang Dr. Bartolo, a more important character. You couldn't very well have both characters on stage at the same time, and so Antonio is excised from this particular act. Now, at this point in the drama, the audience has seen a variety of confusions already occur. Carabino, who uh, the Count would be angry to find out has been in the Countess's chambers, has hidden uh, the Countess's closet, and uh, is eventually discovered there by Susanna, who takes his place in the closet. Carabino jumps out of the window into the garden in order to avoid conf uh, confrontation by the Count, and eventually Figaro joins this mess and tries to make the best of it as well. So as we enter the finale, the Count has entered the room very angry, uh, looking for Carabino, and he's asking of the Countess, uh, who is in your closet? And over the course of the finale, we're also wondering, uh, the characters are also wondering who actually jumped out of the window. Was it Carabino? Was it Figaro? As Figaro tries to convince the Count it was. And then looming over all of this are the contents of the dropped note that Antonio found. Figaro does not know that this is, in fact, Carabino's commission. All, uh, and the Count is trying to trick him into revealing that he does not know the contents of the note, but eventually Figaro is able to guess correctly the contents of the note. Just as it seems that the good guys are about to win, Marcellina, Don Basilio, and Dr. Bartolo barge into the scene, and they reveal the terms of Figaro's contract, which if he cannot honor the money that he owes to Marcellina, he will have to marry her. And thus, the the act ends in total confusion with the heroes of the opera thrown, um, thrown off by the revelation of Marcellina's contract. And all these existing questions are up in the air. So even though we've traveled all this way with various plot points, we still end in this sort of murky mess that the rest of the opera attempts to solve. So with all of that going on, there's a ton of plot that is thrown at us and it's all thrown at us in music. And it is supposed to, again, reach the zenith of the crazy day. So what does Mozart do in order to splice up this 940 bars of constant action, of constant subterfuge, and of constant ups and downs between the characters? Understandably, he starts by uh, following Lorenzo de Ponte's text. So as different characters join in the plot or are discovered in the plot, Mozart uses that opportunity to create different sections of music. We'll see that illustrated firstly in this, uh, this opening clip where the Count is asking the Countess who is in the closet. <laughs> So 
So right in that opening little movement, we see some of the techniques Mozart A used in Act One, Scene One, which we discussed in a previous lecture, but also those musical contrasts that are going to be key for him in delineating the different parties at play in this act finale. So the count comes barging in with a, a, a bouncing sort of angry line, bum, 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 do, so, do, one, five, one, very bombastic. And then the countess, frenetic and worried, has a much more florid line. And again, Mozart paints these in very broad strokes so that we are immediately able to hear the differentiation between these two characters' mindsets. Now, in order to make that work on a broader scale, Figaro simply blows it up. So when we have a duo singing about something against a trio, against a solo, he just gives them a very particular type of music that is very clearly articulated to the ear and then can interweave those, those parts separately in order to depict the contrasting mindsets of the different characters. On a broader sense, Mozart also does some skillful maneuvering with his key choices. Um, and all of those key choices and musical decisions evolve out of a basic segmentation of the plot into eight discrete parts. So rather than take 940 bars and try to write something cohesive, we begin to see the segmentation of the action, first into plot, then into the type of music that Mozart sets for the plot. So in that opening passage, the Countess admits to the Count that Carabino is in the closet, which makes the Count angry. But then Susanna comes out of the closet uh, and confusion ensues. The Count pleads forgiveness and the Countess draws out that process, but ultimately agrees. This is when Figaro joins. So we'll notice that we're gradually accumulating characters. This is part of the opera buffa convention of Mozart's time. The Count confronts Figaro with the Carabino's letter that he dropped. Figaro says that he did not write it. Then Antonio the Drunk Gardener enters. We've added another character, and it's another opportunity to respond with new music for Mozart. He complains of Carabino jumping out of the window, not knowing that it was Carabino. Now, the Count presses the issue, but Figaro and the rest undercut Antonio by saying that he is a drunk and he wouldn't have known anything. In fact, it was Figaro who jumped out of the window, not Carabino. So Antonio gives the dropped letter to the Count, which momentarily foils Figaro, but then he guesses that it is Carabino's commission. And finally, rather than uh, draw this out any further, Mozart throws Marcellina, Basilio, and Bartolo into the scene all at once to stake Marcellina's claim over Figaro. This ends the act with the nobles, in a, or it, rather the, the heroes in a state of confusion. Now, in these eight discrete sections then of added characters and added plot twists, Mozart responds with very particular types of music for each section. So in that opening section, in which the Count and the Countess are going back and forth, we begin in the key of E flat major. This is uh, very noticeable because the opening overture is in fact in D major. And so uh, that's a two sharp key signature. And here we've moved to E flat, which has three flats. And so we've traveled this, this uh, chromatic half step, which again is Mozart in the most global of senses going up a half step and then down uh, at the end of the opera back into D major as we hit the furthest point from the beginning and end, we are a half step higher. We also begin in an allegro 4-4 and you'll see in this list before you then in the second, uh, the second plot point when Susanna then comes out of the closet, we actually are introduced into this uh, fourth section of music, this D section. Uh, this is notable because it sort of slides us out of the flat region in B flat major into G major. And then Mozart hangs around in uh, closely related keys of C major and F for a little bit before leaping back once more to close out the, uh, the finale in the B flat major and E flat major realm. And so in a very broad sense, he takes advantages of certain principles of transposition and form known as sonata form, a uh, very popular symphonic genre of the time. He can script some of those principles in order to advance the dramatic action moving forward and move through these different keys. You'll notice also he provides that ever desired variety, allegros, andantes, allegro molto, as well as time signatures in 4-4-3-8-2-4-6-8. Now, each of these time signatures and these, uh, these tempi 
are not only operating in isolation. Like the minuet in our previous lecture, they actually form part of a complex of, of dance significations for Mozart's audiences. Thus, with the martial count at the beginning, we begin in crisis with a very martial sort of uh, confrontation between the two figures. And then that resolves into a nice, uh, a nice stately minuet. And then in the moment of triumph, we have an allegro. And then with Figaro's entrance, we move into a paspide. This is a dance, uh, this is a rather terrestrial dance, a lower class dance. And so Figaro here is speaking more in his own social register. It's signifying the entrance of the servant type. Uh, from there, we move to a gavotte and several sort of typical buffa figures, these sorts of runs and trills in these moments of crisis. And so as we sort of vacillate between moments of resolution and crisis, Mozart injects that ever needed sense of variety, but he does so always with attention to the social registers of the characters in such a way as to respect their autonomy as servants, professionals, or, or nobility. And then the intersection of these parts lends a not insignificant amount of interest to the equation. So in closing, we finally end in a moment of crisis. And as mentioned, the way to do this is not simply to just lapse into an aria or something like that, but instead, as we reach the height of the confusion, throw uh, Mozart, De Ponte, and Mozart, throw as many characters as they can muster uh, out of the main cast onto the stage. And we do that with, again, a very sectional sort of entrance uh, from, stage, uh, from stage left. <laughs> One musical section. And just in that passage, we see something of the organizational control that composer and librettist exert, as well as the director, that they exert over us in order to make sure that the audience feels secure despite all of the crazy occurrences. The different parties in the opera are placed very deliberately at places on the stage. As we heard right before the entrance of uh, Marcellina, Dr. Bartolo, and Don Basilio, we, um, we very effectively close out a musical section. These are not key changes and sectional changes that are, uh, that are disguised in any way. They are very clear cadences. They are moments of the action closing or shifting in some way. So too, when Susanna emerges from the closet, the orchestration changes, the tempo changes, the time signature changes, the key changes, all of these are immediately apparent to the ear. So too, in, in this particular section. Uh, the characters who are on stage at the time are very deliberate in closing out a particular musical and dramatic idea and all of a sudden boom 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 knock on the door here we are into a brand new musical section that's actually going to throw everything that's come before it uh, completely off kilter and close us in a moment of confusion so we see in this particular act two finale there's nothing that mozart and de ponte do that is unconventional let's say this gradual accumulation of characters, the division into sections, the uh, introduction of new plot points, that is, for example, Marcellina's contract, all of these are expected of the Buffa finale. Now, where Mozart and De Ponte excel is in marshalling out that action exactly so that the audience is never lost. They are, they again, paint very much between the lines and line it up so that the audience is able to follow through. The confusion uh, such as it exists is always on the part of the characters. The audience uh, is always on the part of the characters. The audience is never meant to be left in any sense of confusion. And in order to do that, you have to be incredibly clear about, again, the keys that you choose, the tempos you choose, and how you arrange them. The great uh, sort of innovation of this period is doing all of that in music, eschewing recitative, and in order to do that, you have to have music that is able to be contrasted in these, uh, 
in these sort of segments. So as we heard at the beginning, the Count having very particular music for his musical idea, and the Countess immediately after expressing herself in very different music. So part of uh, classical phrasing and classical musical structure is uh, the ability to deploy these discrete chunks and weave them together in order to create a uh, dramatic and musical whole. So with that, we close out our brief discussion of the Act Two finale of uh, Le Nozze di Figaro. In the next lecture, we're going to pivot to talking about beautiful music in this opera, what uh, style it's written in and what it has to say about the interpretation of this opera. So I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you at the next lecture.